Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in our study of this book uh, by Josh McDowell, More Than a Carpenter. And today is part nine in this study. And each study has been almost two hours long, so we've already spent quite a bit of time in this little tiny paperback, but it's it's just full of, of great information. And I, I believe this discussion has been one of my most enjoyable studies. Um, if you did not see the previous uh, episodes here, the first eight, uh, they're uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, you can go back and watch it back from the beginning if you like. Um, before we get started, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Joe and Brother Ted to introduce themselves. How about, Joe, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, this is uh, Joe, and I, I've got the uh, Sebastian Dresden channel. It's uh, not a, a ministry channel. It's more just for a fellowship channel and, and uh, interesting thoughts. So I look forward to anyone that wants to uh, fellowship. Uh, just feel free to sub, and I'll sub you back. And looking forward to uh, continuing in the book today, Luke. All right, thank you. And Joe just received one of the highest uh, YouTube honors. It's very prestigious. He He's on my list of recommended channels. In fact, I even put him at the top of the list. So I hope you will subscribe to his channel, Sebastian Dresden. Uh, and now we have Brother Ted. Thanks, Brother Ted. And my uh, YouTube channel is God's Truth Ministries. And uh just now getting back into posting some more videos and uh, more on the way, those of you who are wondering about that. But uh, today we've got uh, the special treat continuing through this book, More Than a Carpenter. Like I said, last time we were together, uh, this book was really special to me. It has a special place in my heart uh, ever since I read it when I first got saved back in 88. So I hope you guys will stick around for it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess it's worth repeating that uh, over the years I've bought many of these books. I used to buy them and I think they were came in a 12-pack. Uh, you could go to the Christian bookstore and buy 12 of them for $15 or something or $10. I don't know. They were very, uh, if you bought one of them, it was probably $3. But if you bought a package of them, it was very reasonable. And I passed them out quite a bit in, over the years. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, my nephew Ken, my old friend Tony, and a few others. The, the, this book was really the the first step in them um, coming to salvation. It was so so persuasive. It's only 128 pages, but it uh, it is really really um, informative, and I think it gives a great confidence in Jesus and the Scriptures. All right, now we're going to pick up. Uh, let me see. We only have, I think, a page and two and a half pages left in this chapter. Uh, this chapter seven. So let me just continue on here. It says there. It said there were four four points um, that uh, he was emphasizing about the apostle Paul, and this is the fourth point. It says fourth, Paul's mission was transformed. He was changed from a Gentile hater to a missionary uh, to uh, Gentiles. He was changed from a Jewish zealot to an evangelist to Gentiles. As a Jew and Pharisee, Paul looked down upon the despised Gentile as someone inferior to God's chosen people. The Damascus experience changed him into a dedicated apostle with his life's mission aimed toward helping the Gentile. Paul saw in, in the Christ, uh, who appeared to him, the Savior for all people. Paul went from being an Orthodox Pharisee, whose mission was to preserve strict Judaism, to being a propagator of that new radical sect called Christianity, which he had so violently opposed. There was such a change in him that, quote, all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this Jesus uh, and, and who, uh, who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Unquote. That's Acts 
21. All right, well, that's a good place to pause here. Uh, Brother Joe, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my, my thoughts are that this book uh, not only uh, sets out to prove the Bible in, in historical terms and in uh, scientific terms, which it does very well later on, uh, and it, it also uh, seeks to show proof through supernatural transformation in, in, in the characters uh, that are in the Bible. Uh, there, are, there are historical characters that have unexplainable transformations, Paul being the chief among these. And uh, it is, it's a, a valid proof, if you ask me, that uh, something supernatural happened, something happened uh, to cause this person who is the chief of the Pharisees and persecutors of Christ and, and his followers into the chief advocate and, and martyr uh, of the same. So a, a really strong proof, if you ask me. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, okay, thank you. And Brother Ted? Yeah, the one thing about that, uh, and I agree with what, what Joe just said, one of the things was that uh, not only uh, was Paul changed from what he was before, you know, uh, Paul changed. Uh, he was a, he was a separatist. He was an elitist. Uh, you know, uh, in today's world and culture, he'd be you know he'd be called a racist. But yet, you know, the thing is that he would be the one that uh, that God would use. Uh, he had such a dramatic change. He would be the one God used to uh, to reach the nations, to reach the Gentiles, the nations other than uh, Israel, Judah, and. Uh, uh, and for him to say uh, throughout his epistles that the other nations, that the other peoples, the other people groups would be uh, not only included, but that they would be uh, on an equal basis, uh, fellow heirs uh, and sharers uh, equally in the gospel of Christ. And it was all because of the merits of what Christ has done is, is something really amazing that shows the dramatic change that he had in his life and the purpose that, that God uh, had for him. So back to you. Yeah, uh, this um, this is the end of chapter seven. Uh, I think chapters six and seven, maybe even chapter five, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, this is all dealing with uh, the resurrection of Jesus as being the turning point, what that gave uh, that changed so many people from the apostles being cowards, hiding out for their lives, fear of their lives thought thinking that they killed Jesus and now they would be looking for the apostles to kill them and and they were transformed from cowards to the most courageous um, preachers proclaiming Jesus has risen from the dead uh, knowing that that was going to eventually lead to their own death uh, and with the Apostle Paul the same thing this uh, uh, post um, resurrection appearance of Jesus to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, who later became known as the Apostle Paul, that uh, resurrection appearance uh, is the turning point that, that made such a dramatic change in him that we've been describing, you know, this 180 degree change. Um, I, I think I mentioned this before, but I do have a video that's short, it's probably about 15 or 20 minutes long, and I think the title is of the three most important events in history, or maybe, no, no, it's uh, the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and then I, I claim that these are the three most important events in history, but the, the, to sum that up briefly, the, the birth of Jesus is when God, eternal God Almighty became a man, and he did it so that he could die. Now, God can't die, so he had to become a man in order to die for our sins, uh, and then the of course, the next event is, uh, you know, so his birth and then his death was the payment for the sins of all mankind. And then the resurrection. Uh, I hope everybody's understanding from these last couple of chapters this, the, the, the great importance of this resurrection. This was the proof that Jesus promised. This is the, the proof that changed all these people from cowards and uh, to, to uh, being uh, preachers, uh, the, uh, 
for of the of the resurrection and changed Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, murderer of the church, to um, uh, the, the greatest evangelist uh, and one who wrote about half of the New Testament scriptures. <laughs> uh, it was this bodily resurrection that Jesus appeared to them. It was the sign that gave them that that uh, that confidence and and that resurrection serves that purpose for us today, knowing. The, the dramatic change in these people because of the resurrection, but then, then I in turn can say, uh, I have confidence too because I can see the effect the resurrection had on them and therefore I have also confidence that he truly did raise himself bodily from the dead, showing us that he is God and Savior and he does have power over life and death. That's how important this resurrection is. Uh, before I read it any further, Joe, any thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to expand on, on something Ted said. Ted hit something really important that I kind of missed. All of the other uh, disciples, apostles, uh, gradually uh, accepted Christ as who he said he was, especially after he rose and did what he said he would do. But uh, this, this thing with Paul, that you know, there's a reason we still quote, uh, the old saying, the, I had a road uh, to Damascus experience. Paul changed instantly in front of companions. And like Ted said, I hadn't thought about it. Uh, Paul was a racist. He was a big time racist. He believed that the Jews were the chosen people uh, outside the, the, the Jewish race uh, were basically dogs and, and uh, certainly not on the level of the Jews. And how often uh, do you see someone who is that racially uh, motivated, that much of a racist, instantly change to someone who's embracing the heathen? And, uh, and all of his ideas, unlike any of the other apostles, uh, was instantly changed and in front of witnesses. So uh, I think that's that's really powerful testimony. That's that's it, Luke. All right, thanks, uh, Brother Ted. Anything else before we continue on? Well, I would just add too that I think it also uh, continually going to the Gentiles, uh, or you know, and into those regions. Of course, we know throughout the Book of Acts he would go to the Jew first, to the synagogues, but yet uh, he never had any qualms. About, uh, about going to the Gentiles and to those Gentiles who would come to the synagogues, uh, you know, in the places where they were allowed to heal, uh, or excuse me, hear. Uh, I think uh, uh, the ministry that God had for Paul uh, in the aspect of, of going to the Gentiles, I think that, that kept him humble <laughs> throughout the rest of his life that, uh, that God would have him in that position. So that's all I had to add to that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. The um, this racism that uh, we were talking about here. Uh, we, I know we mentioned it in an earlier uh, study, but uh, many people are probably not aware of the fact that the the whole nation of Israel was was racist and separatist. Uh, it was their belief system that there should be no intermarrying. Uh, and not only inter intermarrying was forbidden, but even associating, having friendships. Uh, you cannot even sit at the same table and eat food with a Gentile. Um, and then worst of all was a Samaritan who was the result of Gentile and Jewish intermarrying. And they're part Jew, part Gentile. That's a Samaritan. And they were the most scorned of all because they that was the result of violating this, uh, this uh, segregation law. Um, so... That's why when the Apostle Peter preached to Cornelius and his family, and they, these Gentiles got saved, and James and the other ap apostles in Jerusalem were, were uh, just, the first, their, their first reaction was they were sickened and angry that he would even do such a thing before it was finally accepted that this is what God wanted. So the, the first reaction was an example of this racist, separatist attitude, and Paul being one of the most religious of all the Jews, then of course he's, he would be an extreme example of, of this uh, this mindset. All right, let me read a little further then. It says the 
Historian Philip Schaff states, quote, the conversion of Paul marks not only a turning point in his personal history, but also an important epoch in uh, the history of the apostolic church and consequently in the history of mankind. It was the most fruitful event since the miracle of Pentecost and secured the universal victory of Christianity, unquote. That's from historian Philip Schaff. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. He, he says it's the most important historical event in the church uh, uh, after the after Pentecost. I never really thought to think of it in that way, but let me get your reaction to that. Uh, if you if you're speaking to me, Luke, I, I would agree. I mean, uh, what has changed? Yeah, Christ uh, uh, was like you said the most important event. Uh, uh, then, then Pentecost was the uh, the Holy Spirit uh, replacing Christ in, in in the lives of believers. But Paul, uh, man, that Paul changed the world through Christ. Uh, like you said, he he's responsible for nearly half of the New Testament, and uh, nearly all of this the the churches outside of Judaism, and the believers outside of Judaism uh, coming to faith. So yeah, he, he, he basically started the fire that uh, is still burning today. So yeah, I would agree. Yeah, brother brother Ted, do you, do you think that this uh, conversion of Paul uh, is second in importance to uh, the Pentecost? Well, I, I definitely do see uh, a change. It's definitely not only a, you know a turning point in in. Saul slash Paul's life, of course, but uh, you know, after Paul's conversion, uh, you do see uh, the emphasis and the focus of the Book of Acts uh, really go from from you know Peter and the and the other eleven uh, to really just Paul and well Paul and Barnabas at first, and then of course after Paul and Barnabas had their their split <laughs> over John Mark and. His instability. Uh, then you see the focus really becoming uh, Paul and Barnabas and their travels. And one thing you see about that, and this is kind of another subject altogether, but uh, the reason <clears throat> I think history kind of changed there was, uh, you know, up until uh, AD 69, 70, uh, the Jews still had their their temple, their temple worship, their sacrifices. And the Jews, uh, uh, you know, still had an opportunity to receive Christ as the Christ, as the Messiah. And Paul went to the Jew first in every place he went. That was his custom, it says. Um, and what you see there in the Book of Acts, the reason I think it's such a such an of an important uh, such an emphasis is, it shows the Jews' rejection of Jesus Christ. Uh, in such an ultimate and permanent sense, and when somebody does something on, in a, in a, that has such uh, uh, consequences uh, of doing something so permanent, uh, the consequences are catastrophic. I mean, we can all make bad decisions all along the way of something, but when we, when we either as individuals or collectively, like Israel did, something of such a, a permanent consequence, uh, it changes things. It changes the course of people's lives. And uh, that's certainly the case with the uh, with the Jews collectively, uh, especially the religious leaders, their rejection of Christ as Messiah. And consequently, what became of that is God says, "Okay, I'm going to make uh, I'm going to make uh, lemonade out of the lemons you guys are serving." Uh, you know, uh, Paul over three times in Acts, he says, "Okay, you guys won't hear. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles." And uh, that's what happened. And maybe we can continue to talk about that. But uh, that that's what was brought to my mind when you said, you know, it was a changing point in history or it's the biggest event since Pentecost. So I would agree. Hmm. Well, uh, you know, we, we, we have talked and we'll, we'll continue to talk about Paul and, and how important and relevant he was and, and still is. Um, 
I, for a long time, I always personally just ranked Paul as the greatest apostle, the greatest Christian ever. Uh, but I, I kind of repented of that, and, and because I, as great as he was, I mean, I realized that every apostle uh, suffered a martyr's death. Uh, they gave it all, even their life. Um, except the Apostle John, and he was willing to give his life. And he, tri, uh, legend or, or tradition says that they did try to kill him, but they, they failed. They tried to boil him on oil, but he couldn't be killed. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. So he was exiled, imprisoned. And so he did suffer as, in, in that type of martyrdom also for, for Christ. So um, in terms of teaching, though, we do have a sect of uh, Christians that I, I, I don't challenge their the validity uh, as Christians. Uh, I, I would think of them as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, but I, I think that they err in elevating Paul above all apostles. In fact, in a way, they're elevating above even Jesus um, because they claim that you cannot get saved by... Uh, any other writings in the Bible except what Paul wrote. For some of the argue about where in Paul's writings, some think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, uh, others say it was later in his prison letters. Uh, uh, but most of they all agree that, that you cannot get saved by the red letters. Now the red letters, when publishers, uh, you know, they publish a Bible, the ink is black, except when they think these are the exact words of Jesus, they, they print those letters in red. Um, it, many Bibles are they're called red letter Bibles. And they, they say you can't get saved by the red letters. The words of Jesus, there's no salvation in, in their words. It's a different message. And um, so they say you can't get saved from Jesus or from Peter or from John, only from Paul. And I've, I've fought hard against that the last few years. Uh, I have a playlist, Paul Onlyism, debunked. So as great as a Paul was, and as, as, as I said, I've, I've uh, esteemed him above all other apostles uh, for a long time, but I think it is a mistake to, uh, uh, certainly is a mistake to be a Paul Onlyist, but um, I also think that we, we don't, do not want to diminish Jesus' own teachings. We don't want to diminish what was taught by John and, and Peter. They all taught the same message. And to me, the distinction is Jesus, John, and Peter, they, they taught you're saved by faith. And But John, Paul, he had an extra burden on him because, because he had this, uh, as we discussed last time, this, uh, thorn in his side. Is that how it's phrased? Thorn in the side? I forget. But um, I suggested last time that the, th the thorn in the side is not some kind of a physical ailment, but it's, if you read the whole chapter in context, it's the, um, it's the Judaizers that were following him where, wherever he went. Every time he established a church, they'd go in there and pollute the church and say that Paul taught you wrong. You've got to practice Judaism. These were called the Judaizers. And so um, Paul had an extra burden that Jesus, John, and Peter didn't have. They just taught, believe on the Lord Jesus, okay, and you'll be saved. Peter was the first one to coin that phrase, actually, uh, with Cornelius. Uh, but, but Paul realized that his everything he was done was being spoiled. Uh, and... Uh, and he, so he had to write additionally, not only have I taught you, you're saved by faith in Jesus, but don't you dare add any other requirements. Don't add Judaism to it. If you add Judaism to it, then you've ruined it, and it's of no effect. So that was the actual burden of Paul, and that's the, the, the great contribution of Paul, in my opinion, is that he said not only are you you're saved by believing, but only believing, faith alone. Don't add anything else to it, or you've ruined it. Um, well, I don't know if you want to say anything about that before I read on, but uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, there's a there's a whole school of thought out there with the, uh, the Paul-only uh, uh, believers. Uh, 
they're not Paul onlyism. It's more like uh, they they believe that that Paul illuminated uh, the things of Christ in a way that is uh, uh, acceptable and digestible to non-Jewish believers, and they have a point there. But when you get to the part where you know they say you know only read Romans through Philemon uh, because that's where that's the only thing written to uh, uh, believers today. I have to uh, disagree most uh, stringently. I mean, salvation message is given clearly in John, and I believe Christ uh, was was giving the salvation message through letting us know that we could not keep the law. You know, the Sermon on the Mount is a prime example of Christ showing Israel that keeping the law is impossible. And so uh, Paul definitely uh, helped us see more clearly what Christ's teachings uh, were relating us to. Uh, so he was a, a, an illuminating factor for sure. But to say that the gospel is not taught anywhere except Romans through Philemon is ridiculous. And uh, <clears throat> you can be saved reading only Romans through Philemon, or you can be saved only reading John 3.16. So uh, I, I think they're, they're off point there. And I think that when you see the way Christ taught us that we cannot keep the law, it really illuminates even more the things that Paul uh, taught us. So uh, I think there's a beautiful balance that, that we need to observe and, and leave nothing out. All right, yeah, thank you. And Brother, Brother Ted, you know, we're emphasizing Paul's importance right today, but, but I, I'm also just pointing out that some people have taken it too far, and I know, you're, I know you have an opinion on that too. Well, I just concur with what both of you uh, have said. Uh, and, uh, you know, whenever, whenever a Christian or anybody takes things uh, to an extreme, uh, you know, things get out of balance. And that, that's, I think, what the, uh, the main pro problem of the, the people who elevate Paul to a, a position that, that God didn't really intend to. I think it's just, uh, it's a position that's out of balance and it's overemphasizing and uh, delineating in places where there isn't. So back to you. Uh, all right. And before I continue, I also want to also argue that um, there is another uh, faction of Christians. Now, these people are not going to be so generous and, and even concede that they are truly Christians. Uh, but these are the people who are the Paul haters that argue that Paul was antinomian, that he uh, he was against the law, and that uh, Paul was a false apostle. And these were the people in Paul's days that were the Judaizers. And so this uh, teaching that faith in Jesus is not enough, you must also be religious, particularly practicing all of Judaism, that goes back to the beginnings of the church, but it's continued throughout history, and it's still very problematic today. Uh, almost all the people that we know of today who are uh, what we call lordship salvationists um, that's how they see it. They think that Judaism, that Paul's wrong, that Judaism, uh, legalism, uh, plus Jesus is salvation. Um, some of them don't come out and say that Paul was a false apostle, but some dare to do that. There's a, quite a faction of people that are still today arguing that Paul, Paul was a false apostle. And he wrote, actually wrote in his defense uh, um, regarding this issue. Uh, defending that he truly is an apostle. I guess I, since I opened up that can of worms, I'm going to let you respond to that too, Brother Joe. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking, I was watching a teaching that I discussed with you right before we started the show, and it was an hour-long teaching with a lot of silliness involved. But one thing that, uh, that this guy got right, and it's, I think it's a problem with these works salvationists or legalists, uh, is they, they have a duplicitous nature. They have a, a dualistic vision of man. They, they seem to think that there's body and then soul. There's the, the, the mind and the soul, and, the, and then there's the body. What they're not realizing is that the spirit is, is part of us. We're, we're a triune being in ourselves, made in the image of God. 
And, you know, when uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden, uh, he, God said, the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Now, the day, their bodies didn't die that day. Their bodies were corrupted and, and took a long time to die. And, and Satan's lie was, did he say you would surely die? You know, so what died on that day? That was their spirit. Their spirit died upon uh, disobedience to, to God. And so mankind has a dead spirit that's passed down uh, through the generations. When we accept Christ, that spirit is made alive. And that's how we commune with God. And that spirit is pure and it's incorruptible. And no matter what we do, whether we sin every day or struggle, or no matter what we do, that spirit is pure. And that's our communion with God is made alive through belief in Christ. And so uh, they don't see that we have an incorruptible seed within us now. The spirit has been made alive. And they, they only see the soul and the body. And they think, well, if you don't have a clean soul, how are you going to, you know, be acceptable before God. They, they have a, a dualistic instead of a triune view of mankind, and that may be their mistake. Back to you, Luke. Mm, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, um, brother, uh, brother Ted, your thoughts on that? Well, I, I didn't want to comment on that as much as going back to uh, what your question was at first, although I agree with what Joe's saying there. Uh, you know, these people who uh, are the other extreme, the people who did, who reject Paul and think that he was a false apostle, I, I just have to say, uh, do you not believe the book of Acts? Uh, because uh, in the book of Acts, uh, God in a vision came to Ananias and said, receive, you know, receive Paul, go to him, receive him, uh, lay hands on him so he can regain his sight, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to Gentiles, to kings, and to the children of Israel. And, uh, and do they not believe the book of Acts where uh, Peter and the, and the rest of the disciples received Paul? They received And then the meeting in Acts 15 to where uh, they told Paul and Barnabas to go to the Gentiles uh, and that uh, and the, the Jewish disciples would continue to go to the Jews, the children of Israel. Um, do, they not, do they not believe Peter? in his own holy writings that says, uh, I think Peter says at the end of uh, Second Peter, uh, as much as our beloved brother Paul has also written to you, as in his other epistles, uh, people have things that they twist uh, uh, to their own uh, dis destruction or something like that. Uh, so uh, these people who, have, who are against Paul in that, in that way are more, are more wacky than anybody because they're not even believing uh, the the writings that, that are right there in the Bible and epistles other than Paul. So that's all I had to say about that. Yeah, that, that statement by Peter, uh, on, he, he not only is identifying Paul as a brother, uh, but, he, but he's also claiming and, and recognizing Paul's writings as scripture. So, uh, but the only reason I'm even bringing this point up at this now is, is because Josh McDowell is saying that this event at the road to Damascus was the most important event in church history uh, after the uh, uh, Pentecost. And so that's why I am trying to address the, uh, the importance of Paul. Um, it, we must not, uh, if you're rejecting Paul as a false apostle, then you've got a big problem. As, uh, the scriptures clearly identify him as apostle. Uh, and and he's, he was accepted as an apostle by the others. But also, if you go to the other extreme and elevate Paul above all the apostles, even elevate him above Jesus, saying you can only be saved by listening to Paul, then you've, you've erred also. Well, so let me read on then. Uh, uh, during lunch at the University of Houston, I sat down next to a student as we discussed Christian, Christianity, he made the statement that there wasn't any historical evidence for Christianity or Christ. He was a history major. I noticed that one of his books was a Roman history textbook. 
he acknowledged that there was a chapter dealing with the Apostle Paul and Christianity. After reading the chapter, the student found it interesting that this section on Paul started by describing the life of Saul of Tarsus and ended with a description of the life of the Apostle Paul. In, in, the next, um, in the next to the last paragraph, the book observed that what happened in between was not clear. After I turned to the book of Acts and explained Christ's post-resurrection appearance to Paul, this student saw that it was the most logical explanation of Paul's conversion. Later, he also trusted Christ as his Savior. Hallelujah. Brother Joe? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the people in higher learning especially uh, leave out so many facts. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're learning uh, edited history, and, and, uh, and the emphasis is placed on, on the natural and anything that uh, has a supernatural inclination is ignored and, and uh, discredited. So uh, throwing a little light uh, uh, did it for this guy and, and hopefully for a lot more. Yeah, I'm, there's, I'm sure that was many, many years ago that this uh, took place with Josh McDowell and that student and, and that history book. I'm just wondering if there's any history books published today that would even have that account in it. Brother Ted? Well, that's uh, that's an issue. That, the, the, the issue is nowadays uh, uh, is all of academia. Uh, those who control academia right now from uh, oh, don't even get me started, from kindergarten through graduate school uh, uh, history is being rewritten and I mean if McDowell wrote that book in probably what maybe the late 70s or something um, I mean uh, to think that uh, to think that there's an opinion nowadays going on by these so-called new atheists that, that Jesus didn't even exist and they're forgetting <laughs> they're willfully uh, you know having uh, selective learning selective history of, of, of the contemporaries of that time who uh, who knew of Christ's existence? They didn't believe him to be the Messiah and so forth. But uh, even uh, you know, other than Josephus, there was others. There was others that were contemporaries. Uh, it just—it's just a matter of uh, you know, whoever really wants uh, to know the truth. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that student did for sure. Back to you. Yeah, I—I I remember. Um... In an earlier chapter, we're talking about the premise C.S. Lewis put forth about you're only left with three choices regarding Jesus. and He's either Lord, God, Savior, or he's liar, or he's a lunatic because he claimed to be God and the only Savior, and therefore he's either a liar or a lunatic or truly who he claimed to be. That was a very interesting um, time that we studied that. But there, I said there's a fourth option, and then that's what the Muslims and the and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and the and the uh, Mormons have done is saying, well, the scriptures can't be trusted; they've been corrupted. So it, Jesus didn't really say those things. Uh, but the the fifth, there's a fifth option here too, and that is that, like you just said. Some people actually will have the audacity to, to charge, well, Jesus didn't even exist. He's not even a real historical figure. And obviously, he wasn't Lord Liar or Lunatic. He just never existed. That, that's absolutely the most absurd of all the, the choices. Um, all right, let me read a little further. Elias Andrews comments, quote, uh, many have found in the radical transformation of this Pharisee of the Pharisees, the most convincing evidence of the truth and the power of the religion to which he was converted, as well as the ultimate worth and place of the person of Christ. Uh, Archibald McBride, professor at the University of Aberdeen, writes of Paul, quote, beside his achievements, the achievements of Alexander and Napoleon pale in into insignificance, unquote. Clement says that Paul 
quote, bore change seven times, preached the gospel in the East and West, came to the limit of the West, and died a martyr under the, under the rulers, unquote. Uh, Paul stated again and again that the living, resurrected Jesus had transformed his life. He was so convinced of Christ's resurrection from the, the dead that he too died a martyr's death for his beliefs. Two professors at Oxford, Gilbert West and Lord Littleton, were determined to destroy the basis of the Christian faith. West was going to demonstrate the fallacy of the resurrection, and Littleton was going to prove that Saul of Tarsus had never converted to Christianity. Both men came to the opposite conclusion and became ardent followers of Jesus. Lord Littleton writes, quote, The conversion and apostleship of St. Paul alone, duly considered, was of itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation, unquote. He concludes that if Paul's 25 years of suffering and service for Christ were a reality, then his conversion was true for everything he did began with that sudden change. And if his conversion was true, Jesus Christ rose from the dead for everything Paul was and did he attributed to the sight of the risen Christ. That's the end of this, this chapter. Okay, your thoughts on that before we go on to chapter 8, Brother Joe? Well, you know, what comes to mind is, is a Simon uh, Greenleaf quote uh, that, I, that I read a long time ago and, and uh, regarding higher learning and, and, uh, and educating uh, people about, about uh, biblical history. He wrote, sometimes history is written with an eraser. And, and he was making the point that this is a long time ago, mind you, uh, that, that uh, sometimes the best way to defeat Christian thought and to introduce natural thought, natural methods of, of uh, learning history, is to ignore uh, what are clearly uh, world-impacting uh, historical events, such as the life of Christ, the life of Paul. And so uh, regarding today, I, I think that history is written with an eraser, uh, they they have uh, just erased most of this out of textbooks. And how are people to to decide in a in a free thinking way whether there's validity to Christian thought if it's never presented? And I think that's what we have today. I remember when I was in college, I went to a, a little community college at first, uh, Central Oregon, and you know they had very brief. Uh, uh, mentions of biblical history. It was not a. Uh, it was not. We had much, much more information on Black American history than we did biblical history. So it was relegated to to a small section where it should have been the largest. And then when I got to the university, uh, University of Portland, they they put it under legends, myths, and and. Uh, uh, at the same kind of thought that you know Zeus and and uh, Jesus were basically in the same category, and so uh, I think the worst thing is is when they write history with an eraser. They just take out all of the things that could compel someone to to delve deeper. Back to you, Lou. Yeah. Well, they should use ink. It's not easily erased instead of using a pencil. Brother Ted? Okay, finally got unmuted there. Yeah, I mean, uh, just think about the contrast between Saul of Tarsus and the one who became Paul. I mean, uh, Christ's position, Christ in Paul's mind, Saul's mind, uh, Saul of Tarsus and his reputation and what he was doing before that. I mean, having Christ as his most hated enemy and his followers as, uh, you know, what we would call, what Paul would consider enemies of the state, you know, uh, uh, to becoming Paul's, to becoming uh, the most dedicated follower of Christ, the most dedicated defender of the faith and the defender of the resurrection everywhere he went. Uh, I mean, it, it meant change for him. 
It meant chains and imprisonment and tortures and, and, and beatings, um, you know, to and defending the resurrection. You know, such a dramatic turnaround like that. Only a living and resurrected Christ appearing to him, you know, more than once, and you know, teaching him the gospel, teaching him the truth, teaching him the fact of how Gentiles would be included, teaching him uh, all the things that he did, appearing to him, only a truly resurrected Christ uh, doing those things and ministering to him like that, only a truly, truly resurrected Christ could and would and did make those kind of differences uh, in Paul's life. So it's, to me, it's undeniable. So back to you. Well, th this next chapter, uh, 8, uh, we're going to be addressing the various arguments people use against the resurrection. So that will be interesting. But, but while I'm thinking about it, you know, I just Googled the, uh, the movie Risen. I know I've mentioned it before. I've recommended it numerous times. The movie just came out uh, earlier this year or, or last year, uh, Risen. Is, is the title, and it's the best movie I've ever seen about the resurrection. It's so accurate and biblically correct, and and uh, so much um, amazing information in it that I, I, I'm determined to do a, a study on it. And just as we're reviewing this book and discussing it, I'd like for us to do the same thing with this movie, Risen. But I'm I'm the only one I know that saw the movie, <laughs> so everybody needs to see. I just looked it up, and you can get it for. Four, four ninety nine from Amazon now as a video. I'm sure there's other ways, but if you just search for it, uh, you, you'll find this. Uh, uh, it says in 33 A.D. a Roman tribune in Judea is tasked to find the missing body of an executed Jew rumored to have risen from the dead. It's really, really good. Uh, okay, let's move on to chapter eight titled, uh, Can You Keep a Good Man Down? A student at the University of Uruguay said to me, quote, Professor McDowell, why can't you refute Christianity, unquote? I answered, uh, for a very simple reason, I'm unable to explain away an event in history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, unquote. After more than 700 hours of studying this subject and thoroughly investigating its foundation, I came to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon people, or it is the most important fact of history. The resurrection issue takes the question, quote, is Christianity valid, unquote out of the realm of philosophy and makes it a question of history. Does Christianity have a historically acceptable basis? Is sufficient evidence available to warrant belief in the resurrection? Some, well, before I go on, uh, let me just get your thoughts to that. And I, I will add to these questions here. What about Paul in... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we were usually refer to as the resurrection chapter. Uh, Paul states that uh, if there was no resurrection, then our faith is in vain and we're all, I forgot how he phrased it exactly, but uh, uh, we're, we're miserable. We should be just miserable and, and it's just, it would be horrible because uh, we're all, it's pointless if there was no resurrection. Nothing was accomplished. We Christianity means nothing without the resurrection. And so uh, that's why I always uh, make sure that everybody understands that this resurrection, uh, understanding that he was raised from the dead, that's what Jesus promised as proof so that we can be confident in him, in who he is and, and, and confident that he, he will be able to keep his promises to us. Um, so... Um, these points that Josh Modell made here at the beginning of this chapter, Brother Joe? Yeah, you'll, you'll have to excuse my train of thought. Sometimes I, I get into a, a linear 
motion and it's hard to get back on track. But uh, what comes to my mind is the fact that this generation and and our generation before it, Luke, uh, they they have erased the thoughts and the possibilities from the students' minds in universities and uh, and even lower. And, you know, it's like you don't consider it. People don't consider the resurrection because they're never challenged with it. And if someone's never challenged to consider the resurrection or the life of Paul, then how are they to uh, think about it, to reason? How are they to reason when there's no facts? And, and it, it's, it's absent, absolutely absent. Christianity has been relegated to myths and legends and and uh, and no one will consider uh, the things that Josh McDowell did because back in his era there was still enough information and interest in the Judeo-Christian mindset or worldview that they would present some facts. That's gone now, and and it's blank. And if someone's to consider the resurrection and consider the facts that we're trying to present. Uh, they have to leave the schools of higher learning and uh, and and hit YouTube or or be presented uh, personally, such as like Lewis and and Toplin. And so uh, I'm just fearful for this generation because the facts will never be considered because history has been uh, written with an eraser uh, in our time. And and I just grieve for so many young minds <clears throat> that'll never even consider what this book is trying to teach. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so Josh Waddell says, after more than 700 hours of studying about the resurrection, and in this chapter here of just a, a few pages, uh, he's going to condense the 700 hours of study on the resurrection into a few pages, condensing it down to the main points, the arguments people have against it, and, and the, his answers, and why he came to the conclusion that the resurrection, you know, he, he is risen. And if he is risen, then it would be foolish to not put our faith in him. Uh, Brother Ted, your thoughts so far? Well, one thing I was going to say on that, and it goes back to, this is just another defense of, of Paul and, and the other disciples preaching, is, um, you know, what you were talking about, that if 1 Corinthians 15, he says, uh, if there's no resurrection, uh, well, if there's no resurrection, Paul wouldn't have been talking about the resurrection of Christ, but he certainly defended that. He says, uh, if there's no resurrection, uh, our preaching is in vain. Uh, our preaching is empty, uh, might say in vain or futile in some other areas. Uh, he says, all, all they that have died in Christ have perished. Uh, and that's another topic for uh, <laughs> uh, state of the dead. But uh, he's saying, uh, if there's no resurrection and Christ didn't raise from the dead, uh, then it's empty, it's futile, it's worthless. And, uh, and he says in verse 15, of that he says yes and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead don't rise so Paul say, says this in that sense we are found false witnesses now think about that to the to the Jewish mindset a false witness is what it's a liar <laughs> and one of the, the big ten one of the big ten commandments uh, is uh, Thou shalt not bear false witness a lie, and this is this is not a lie just about uh, you know whether you stole the cookie or not. This is a lie about something of, of such extreme importance, of something on a level that's like, hey, this is the Christ, and he died for sins and rose again. Paul says we're false witnesses of something so big that 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 we are the most guilty men on earth. If what we're saying isn't true, so uh, for when he says there, if Christ is not raised, uh, your faith is empty, and yes, of God, because we're saying this on behalf of God, 
Paul's saying, this is a big deal. And if it's not true, we're totally guilty and we're false witnesses of God. So uh, Paul uh, doesn't mince any words there. He, he takes it to the extreme and says, we're speaking on behalf of God. And if, we not, and if we're not speaking on behalf of God, of this truth, then we're, we're just the biggest liars in the world. So back to you. All right, thank you. It, um, the book, I'll continue reading, it says, Some facts relevant to the resurrection are these. Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish prophet who claimed to be the Christ, prophesied in the Jewish scriptures, was arrested, judged a political criminal, and crucified. Three days after his death and burial, some women who went to his tomb found the body gone. His disciples claimed that God had raised him from the dead and that he had appeared to them various times before ascending into heaven. From this foundation, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire and has continued to exert great influence down through the centuries. Did the resurrection actually happen? And uh, as we've just been talking and saying that uh, uh, Paul, Paul concludes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that if there was no resurrection, our faith is in vain, and we're just we're like the most miserable. If you can find that verse, and I'd like to hear get the exact words of Paul on that. But let me continue reading. So, uh, the body of Jesus, in accordance with Jewish burial customs, was wrapped in a linen cloth, about 100 pounds of aromatic spices mixed together to form a gummy substance were applied to the wrappings of cloth about the body. And there's footnotes in all this too. I mean, if you get this book, you can look up, confirm all, all, with all these footnotes, his sources for this. After the body was placed in a solid rock tomb, an extremely large stone weighing approximately two tons was rolled by means of levers against the entrance of the tomb. A Roman guard of strictly disciplined men was stationed to guard the tomb. Fear of punishment, quote, produced flawless attention to duty, especially in the night watches, unquote. Uh, this guard affixed on the tomb the Roman seal, a stamp of Roman power and authority. The seal was meant to prevent vandalizing. Anyone trying to move the stone from the tomb's entrance would have broken the seal and thus incurred the wrath of Roman law. But the tomb was empty. <laughs> All right, Brother Joe. Yeah, uh, Luke, I was just looking up uh, the quote here that, that we were looking for, and I don't have the right one, but it's real close. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, and in the King James it says, If in this life only, uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But I think it's back in verse 14, and I don't have time to get there, uh, the, the quote you were speaking of. But yeah, there's there was a, a procedure, you know, to to uh, testify to Christ. Uh, you know, they were making sure no one stole his body. Uh, the the Romans uh, sealed the grave with a, a, a seal of Caesar that meant death for anyone who broke it, and guards that were on duty 24/7 especially paying attention to that third day uh, to make sure that, that on their lives nothing uh, uh, broke that seal and rolled that stone away. And so uh, that's a, that was a, a, a well, I think, a well-documented historical fact outside of the Bible, too. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely tons of evidence. Well, that's why I wanted to emphasize that the, each one of these uh, statements I just read here, every one of them has a footnote with source, source material that uh, you can look up to see how he was able to, to make these uh, these statements. Uh, they're backed up by these historical records and writings and so on. But uh, I'm not going to get 
try to look up all the footnotes in, in this study. Brother Ted? Well, one of the things he said there is, you know, the, the women coming to the tomb, uh, that, that account right there, it made me think of this, um, and this goes more back to the, the truthfulness and, and the trustworthiness of the Bible. Uh, you know, like we said in some of the earlier studies, when, when uh, a couple of early chapters were the defense of the scriptures themselves, well, uh, think about this, the, the women being the first ones to be, you know, witnesses, uh, is a testimony to the truth of the Bible, because uh, the truth of the resurrection. Because women's testimony, it's my understanding in that day from history, uh, women's testimony didn't count like a man's testimony did, you know, in that time, in that culture. Uh, so for the gospel writers to include it, to include the fact that the women were the first ones to see the risen Christ, uh, to me, uh, shows and proves, you know, it happened that way because, uh, you know, I mean, it shows human nature, you know, warts and all. It shows the flaws of, you know, the great patriarchs, David, uh, you know, with his adultery and, and conspiring for murder, Abraham lying, uh, all these things, uh, Mo Mer Moses murdering an Egyptian. I mean, the Bible shows things warts and all because it has to show the truth, the truth about people and the truth about the, the way the events happened. And the fact that you brought up how the women, or the, the Josh McDowell was writing how the account of the women being the first ones to see because they went to, you know, anoint the body and how Christ saw Mary, you know. And uh, to me it's just a testimony and an affirmation of the truth that happened the way it did because the gospel writers could have excluded that and said, oh, well, we disciples were the first ones to see him. No, they had to write it the way it happened, the way, the way it did. And they said, you know, actually, uh, women, Mary was the first one. Uh, they were the first ones to witness the empty tomb. And then they went and told the disciples about it. So that's what I thought of. So back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this, uh, this paragraph here talking about, uh, you know, the details of this burial and entombment and sealing of the tomb and so on, and the guard posting is, uh, I mean, there's an awful lot of uh, important details there that, that we can learn a lot from. But they, I, I'd like to, since we keep on referring to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, there, there's a, a couple of, a few verses here I'll actually want to read. The, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but, uh, but just, I'm going to read from uh, uh, verse 13 through 19, I think. It says, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all we are of all men most miserable. So, I think in those few verses here we we can see how important this resurrection, resurrection that the the truth, that the resurrection really happened, is that important. Um, I'll read a little further in this uh, Josh Waddell book. It says, uh, the followers of Jesus said he had risen from the dead. They reported that he appeared to them during a period of 40 days, showing himself uh, to them by many, quote, convincing proofs, unquote. I like the KJV wording better. In, that, in the KJV, it says infallible proofs. Um, Oh, it, it, has, it says here right in this book, uh, <laughs> the next thing it says there is some versions say infallible proofs. Okay. 
Paul, the apostle, said that Jesus appeared to more than 500 of his followers at one time, the majority of whom were still alive and could, could confirm what Paul wrote. All right. Uh, also, this statement here, uh, that's also found at the beginning. This information here is also found at the beginning of this chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Brother Joe? What occurs to me, Lou, is, is what you've been, you've, you've been quoting, uh, the, the quote that Christ was either a liar, a lunatic, or, or who he said he was. Well, it occurs to me that each one of the apostles, the 500 witnesses, uh, Mary and, and uh, everyone else, also would have to be either liars, lunatics, or truthful. And so uh, a mass lunacy <laughs> is very unlikely. Uh, a mass lunacy is chaotic. It's not reasoned, and it's certainly not stable. And yet, this, if, if they were lunatics, I mean, believing something that wasn't true, you can expect that, that you'd have 512 different versions in some way, yet they're all stable, non-chaotic, ordered, uh, and everyone was in relation with the same truths. Uh, so I don't think it could be lunacy. Now, if we go to their liars, uh, again, all of the this huge mass of people would have to have their stories so straight that that you know these are eyewitnesses. Uh, uh, the conspiracy level. If you get three people in a conspiracy, someone's going to spill the beans. That's why I'm not a real conspiracy nut because uh, conspiracies, by their very nature, fall apart with one person willing to spill the beans. And what we have is a huge mass of humanity where nobody, nobody spilled beans, changed stories. Uh, the fact that they're liars is almost as inconceivable as if they were loonies. Uh, that leaves they were being truthful, and that's just logical. Back to you. Yeah, uh, and these, um, these things you just brought up here, these are all part of the... Uh, theoretical arguments against the resurrection that we're going to be addressing uh, in this chapter here. Uh, but regarding the conspiracy idea that that they're lying and they're just sticking to, to their story, um, it's a, it would be impossible, of course, for everybody to stick to their story because uh, they will either change, they'll either come out with the truth and and uh, because they're bribed. They're offered some some kind of reward for saying that it's no. There was we just made it up, and this is how we did it, or under under torture and, and the sentence of death, they would they would uh, say no. We just made it up, and here's here's how we pulled it off. But uh, it didn't happen. They all they all stuck to the story, uh, resisting bribes, enduring torture and death. Brother Ted. Yeah, what you brought up at the end there about what they endured, and this is and this is the big deal, is that uh, you know is the consequences of them doing that at that time. See, nowadays people can, you know, in this day and age in, in America, you know, anybody can come up with any cockamamie idea and uh, wild-eyed, bug-eyed, uh, uh, you know, theory of anything and, and our belief system or anything, and there's really no consequences. Uh, that wasn't the case in that day. I mean, the consequences, like like you were saying, Luke, uh, you know, and you know, from the Romans, uh, uh, you know, it was crucifixion or at the very least flogging, you know, which some people died in in that, you know, the scourging. Uh, the the consequences were were a big deal. It meant your life, and if, you know, if the Romans didn't get you, then the Jews, you know, like they did to Stephen, the consequences were stoning. And uh, at the very least, if, if someone was, was saying back in that time that, that they did believe Jesus rose from the dead and, and you know, maybe didn't make any waves, the consequences was absolute. Their, you know, the relatives and family members would, would hate them. They would ostracize them. So 
I'd say the big deal is consequences. And from other places, you know, like in Scripture where we read in Acts what happened to the disciples, we read in history, um, you know, what happened to the, the, the believers, the early believers, uh, the consequences are a big deal because people, knowing human nature like we do, uh, the consequences were, were too uh, uh, dramatic, <laughs> too extreme, I'd say. So back to you. All right, thank you. I, I'll read on. A. M. Ramsey writes, quote, I believe in the resurrection partly because a series of facts are unaccountable without it, unquote. The empty tomb was, quote, too notorious to be denied, unquote. Paul uh, Althus states that the resurrection, quote, could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb had not been established as a fact for all concerned, unquote. That's why I just, I'm really, really hoping everybody will watch that movie, the movie Resurrection. It, it, it portrays all of this so perfectly, better than anything I've ever seen. Um, so no one, no one would dispute. If the tomb was not empty, it would have been easily established. Wait, wait a second. You're saying it's empty? Look, let's go check it out. No, look, he's there. He's still there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Paul L. Meyer, Mayer concludes, quote, If the evidence is weighed carefully and fairly, it is indeed justifiable according to the canons of historical research to conclude that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was actually empty on the morning of the first Easter. And no shred of evidence has yet been discovered in literary sources, epigraphy, or uh, archaeology that would disprove this statement, unquote. Brother Joe? Don't laugh, but, but <laughs> what I can't get out of my mind, uh, and this is from a, a direction Ted sent me on here. You know, I, I watch Judge Judy. I'm a big fan. Now, now, granted, she's a pretty talented jurist, but uh, you know, she always manages to get the truth. You know, she's she's famous. She wrote a book, uh, and I'll clean it up. It, it's don't. Don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Uh, when she has someone in her courtroom, and this is just minor stuff, she's always able to get the truth out of people. She'll ask a question one way, then she'll ask it another. And inevitably, <laughs> if you're lying, she's going to catch you. And she tells you, you know, you don't lie to me because I'm talented. I'll find out. I'm smart. And she does. And it's hilarious. That, that she's able to trip up the best liars you've ever seen on uh, People's Court or whatever the show is. And, and she quotes, uh, she, she says a quote all the time, you know, liars have to have a very good memory, so don't go down that path. Well, Ted made the point, these people were not just uh, questioned by Judge Judy. These people were extensively interrogated and tortured to get the truth out of them. Everybody stood that test. Back to you. You know, when you said, um, don't laugh, and then you referenced Judge Judy, I actually laughed out loud. <laughs> but that was a good point, though, Brother Ted. Yeah, I laugh too about you uh, saying that. Uh, but yeah, the refuting, the refutation, uh, I was just thinking of, of the resurrection. It should have been easy. I mean, it should have been easy. I mean, all the Romans had to do is uh, say, you know, hey, you know, uh, here's the body, or, you know, start beating the disciples to death and saying, where's the body? You know, if the body was there, they can they could go to the tomb and say, look, uh, there he is. Uh, you know, he's decomposing, or well, when they the, the mom, or he's preserved there, 
in the mummification process. And that's another thing. Uh, from what I've read about, uh, and Luke, I think you were going to get get into that about the extensive means to where to which they uh, wrapped the body, and uh, you know, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, basted it with the preserving ointments and stuff out of the outside. From what I've read, uh, that uh, you're not getting out of that, you know. I mean, uh, and nobody's taking the body out of that, um, you know. Uh, so the refutation of the resurrection should have been easy. Uh, the fact that they had all these witnesses, over 500, 1 Corinthians 15 says, he was seen uh, by Cephas, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, at once. Uh, and he says, of whom the great part remain to the present. Uh, so it should have been easy. It should have been an easy deal to refute the resurrection. And it wasn't. And all the disciples lived up to it and ended up going to their death because they affirmed the fact. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, um, the last 15 seconds you spoke, Ted, uh, we had a repeated um, uh, buzzing sound, a loud buzzing sound. Uh, like re repeating itself over and over again. I don't know if it was on your end or Joe's end, but uh, I don't know what what device was causing it, but I just want everybody to be aware of it in case you can correct it. Okay, I'll continue uh, reading. It says, um, how can we explain the empty tomb? Can it possibly be accounted for by a natural cause? Based on overwhelming historical evidence, Christians believe that Jesus was bodily resurrected in time and space by the supernatural power of God. The difficulties of belief may be great, but the problems inherent in unbelief present even greater difficulties. The situation at the tomb after the resurrection is significant. The Roman seal was broken which meant automatic crucifixion upside down for uh, those who did it. The large stone was moved up and away uh, from not just the entrance, but from the entire massive sepulcher, looking as if it had been picked up and carried away. There's also a footnote on this point, too, so you can go to the source if you have get this book. The guard unit had fled. Justin, in his digest, uh, 49.16, and I guess is the, the book and page number, I guess, lists 18 offenses for which a guard unit could be put to death. These included falling asleep or leaving one's position unguarded. Uh, well, let me stop there. But there's, a, there's some other good points to follow, so let me just stop there and get Brother Joe's thoughts. Yeah, the, the, the guards, you know, their, their life is at stake. I mean, this was a big deal. You know, uh, uh, the local Roman constabulary is not going to put two guards. Now, this is two guards. This is a double check uh, at, at this grave site, and, and, uh, and that body is not going to be taken unless there's a couple of dead guards there. I mean, something scared them into fleeing their post, knowing their destination. Uh, of death as a result. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that alone is pretty powerful evidence. And, and I didn't know about the, the stone being uh, flung so far. That's amazing, and I, and I was unaware of it. I knew it was, it was rolled away. I had no idea it was displaced in such a way. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, I, I didn't recall that either. That was a very interesting point. Uh, Brother Ted, he's probably left to try to correct that uh, buzzing sound, I'm thinking. Hopefully he'll be able to come back and join us. But, uh, I'll continue reading. It says, the, the women came and found the tomb empty. They panicked and went back and told the men. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John got there first, but he didn't uh, enter it. Uh, he looked in. And there were the grave clothes, caved in a little, but empty. The body of Christ had passed right through them into a new existence. 
let's face it, that would make you quite a believer, at least for the moment. The theories advanced to explain the resurrection from natural causes are weak. They actually help to build confidence in the truth of the resurrection. And we'll go into those as we continue here. But uh, let me get Brother Ted's thoughts thoughts on that. Um, um, there you go, Brother. I'm sorry, Luke. I had to uh, I had to log out and then log back in. I guess I, I was receiving a call. I guess at the tail end of my uh, my uh, piece last time, and I, I I guess the last thing I heard you say was the last 15 seconds is something you probably didn't hear me. So uh, and I haven't heard uh, the last bit you talked on the book. So I'm going to defer to you and Joe for this part. Uh. Oh, okay, then I'll ask Brother Joe to respond to that last paragraph, if you will. Go ahead, Brother. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I forgot what you said. <laughs> could, you, could you just uh, illuminate? Let me, let me, let me go back. My wine wonder, wonders, Luke. I'm sorry. All right, Joe, mute again. I'll, I'll reread this paragraph for both of you, okay? It says, um, the women came and found the tomb empty. They panicked and went back and told the men. Peter and John ran to the tomb. John got there first, but he didn't enter it. Uh, he looked in, and there were the grave clothes, caved in a little, but empty. The body of Christ had passed right through them into a new existence. Let's face it, that would make you quite a believer, at least for the moment. The theories advanced to explain the resurrection from natural causes are weak. They actually help to build confidence in the truth of the resurrection. And these arguments against it, we're going to continue on here and discuss some of those. But first, let me get your, your thoughts on that. Brother Joe? Uh, you're muted, Joe. Are you, are you talking? I was talking indeed. Uh, back in the days uh, when Josh McDowell wrote this book, uh, I don't believe they had done a whole lot of study on the Shroud of Turin. And and I looked into it a little bit, and I'm telling you, I'm a believer. I really think that that, that uh, piece of cloth that the Vatican's hiding way down in their, uh, their dungeons uh, is powerful evidence of the resurrection. And the more people, you know, they, we've had a couple people say, oh, I figured it out, you know, with the negatives and whatnot. But no, there, there's a, a, a radioactive element that was, un, I, I think it's unassailable that the Shroud of Turin is, is a legitimate uh, piece of evidence. And, uh, and the biblical account would uh, certainly verify that the way it's written. And so I think there's even more evidence that could be looked at now. But uh, just the detail in the biblical account is amazing and uh, uh, back to you. Yeah, I, I'm also a believer in the Shroud of Turin and I know that people have tried to uh, um, dispute it, uh, but I think their arguments have been against it have been refuted very well. Uh, but uh, uh, brother, brother Ted, what are your thoughts on all this? Well, I was, I didn't know you were going to go into that because I don't have a copy of the book, uh, but uh, the, the, the way copy the uh, grave clothes were left. I'm going to what? The Shroud of Turin? No, uh, the, the, I didn't know Josh McDowell was going to go into that part about uh, the way the, the grave clothes were still there but sunk in. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was talking about, and you guys might not have heard this, that Reputation should have been easy. That's what I was saying back in my last statement on the last part of the book you were talking about. Uh, they could have either gone there and said, hey, there he's decomposing, or there he is preserved uh, in the mummification process. I'm using that word kind of loosely, but, you know, the, the wrapping of the body and the, and the basting of the body with or the anointing with the preservance uh, to, you know, uh, that, that would have encased his body. Uh, he's not getting out of that. And here's what I want to say about this whole thing there is the grave clothes still wouldn't be there if his body was stolen. I mean, 
because he, they would be all stuck to the body, uh, that, that bloody, disgusting body uh, that they took down from the cross and then wrapped up and put in the tomb. And if they were going to come and, uh, you know, and then uh, put the ointments and the, and the things on it, you know, they would have had to st stole the whole thing, you know. Uh, they would have had to stole grave clothes and all. It will. And just the grave clothes left there. If if the body was stolen, it would have had to take the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, so that that to me that account right there even affirms more the resurrection. So I hadn't thought of that, but that's what I'm throwing out. <laughs> wow. Well, let me tell you, when you said that, my first thought was, brother Ted is brilliant, but because uh, I've never heard that point made before. But actually, you're not brilliant. It's just that I must be like a foolish or an idiot or something because it seems to me that's the most obvious thing to conclude. I don't know how I've never even thought of such a thing. That I mean, if, if we were going to steal a body and it's wrapped up like that, we wouldn't take the time to, to try to get it out. And how would you get it out? It wasn't like it was unraveled. It remained intact, but there's no body inside. Uh, so, but if you were going to steal it, you'd steal the whole thing because you want to get away quickly. You're not going to make any effort to leave the cloth. Uh, so, I've never heard anybody make that point before, but uh, that's a really good point. Uh, let me ask you, see if Brother Joe wants to respond to, to that. Well, I, it's like I put in the sidebar, a very good point, and me too. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, you, that, that re would require a great deal of effort and time if it were even possible, and uh, considering they had Roman uh, soldiers there, uh, just it would be a, a silly thing to do, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that either, but that's a brilliant point. And and Ted's gone again, Lou. Uh, I I think that Ted he's just so humble he he could not endure this this uh, praise that we've given him he's. He's just too humble to accept this praise, but maybe he'll come back. Okay, so I'll continue uh, reading on. It says, one possibility, the wrong tomb, a theory propounded by Kersop Lake assumes that the women who reported the body missing had mistakenly gone to the wrong tomb. If so, then the disciples who went to check up on the women's statement must have must also have gone to the wrong tomb we can be certain however that the jewish authorities who had asked for the roman guard to be stationed at the tomb to pre prevent the body from being stolen wouldn't have been mistaken about the location nor would the roman guards for for uh they were there if the, a wrong tomb were involved the Jewish authorities would have lost no time in producing the body from the proper tomb, thus effectively quenching for all time any rumors of a resurrection. I'll, I'll pause there. Brother, your thoughts? Yeah, I've heard this uh, supposition many times, and it's one of the more specious or s silly suppositions, because number one, maybe God had it planned this way. I guess he probably did. Uh, uh, the, the tomb was not a graveyard. The tomb was not in a commoner's graveyard where there's a tomb over here, tomb over there. It, it was a rich man's tomb, and it was isolated, and it was a, 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 a cave that was set aside for a, a person of, of power and wealth. And additionally, this tomb, unlike others, had a huge stone that, that was very, very difficult to move, and a Roman seal affixed to the stone and the wall. So a uh, mistaken uh, tomb is one of the silliest arguments that I've heard, and I've heard it before, but is easily defeated with those facts. Um, yeah, at the, uh, at the end of the previous paragraph, uh, he, Josh McDell wrote, uh, he said, the theories advanced to explain the resurrection from natural causes are weak. 
they actually help to build confidence in the truth of the resurrection. So uh, I, I think as we go through these um, uh, theor theoretical arguments against the resurrection, you're going to see each one of them is, is absurd, and it, it just, it's laughable. And the first one we discussed, uh, Brother Ted was gone there, but the idea was that they had gone to the wrong tomb, you know. Um, there were some facts that we, we presented showing how absurd that idea is, but without reading it again, Brother Ted, any thoughts? Do you think they might have gone to the wrong tomb? Not a chance. Not a chance. No, they wouldn't have done that. And uh, they would have been easily corrected, you know. Uh, uh, I guess the angels had it wrong, too, because they were there at that one also. <laughs> All right, then. Let's, uh, let's read further. It says, uh, another attempt at explanation claims that the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection were either illusions or hallucinations, unsupported by the uh, psychological principles governing uh, the appearances of hallucinations. This theory also does uh, not coincide with the historical situation or with the mental state of the apostles. So where was the actual body and why wasn't it produced? I'll let Brother Ted go first this time. <laughs> that didn't work. Hey, Brother Joe, you're, you're designated. Well, I think we have to keep an orderliness here, uh, Luke, and, and so uh, uh, fate uh, kept us in line. You know, uh, when, when two people see the same hallucination, you have to question whether it's an hallucination. And uh, when a dozen people have the same hallucination, you even furthermore, well, this is 512 and then some. Uh, when you count the women and you count uh, uh, others, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, you can't have the self-same hallucination. <laughs> this is, I guess maybe they're thinking mass hypnosis or something. Someone came in and, and twirled a pendant in front of them and told them what they're supposed to see. Uh, short of that, I, I can't think of any way that someone could uh, actually gravitate towards any truthfulness in, in that supposition. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about this, this um, the idea that uh, um, there was not a bodily resurrection, there's another answer for it. Uh, it just it just seems to it reeks of desperation. Uh, it's the same kind of thing where um, people cannot accept the existence of God, so they uh, they try to find any other explanation for our, our realities, uh, anything except God, because they're so against the idea that there's a God, when really the most obvious logical explanation for everything is there is a God. And, and the most logical, obvious answer is there was a bodily resurrection, but they, they don't want to accept it, so they, they are just desperate to find some other, other answer. Uh, now, here's a theory. Brother Ted, uh, we, we thought that uh, maybe that we had the, uh, looked for, for the wrong spot and, and uh, like they looked for the wrong tomb and you were gone. You're not there. <laughs> okay, here's another theory. Now, if you can stick around long enough, Brother, Brother Ted, I will let you go first this time. Brother Joe thinks that it's fate, that he's, he's destined to go first every time. And that's why you had to disappear when I called on you. Here's this, the swoon theory. Popularized by Venturini several centuries ago and often quoted today, the swoon theory says that Jesus didn't really die. He merely fainted from exhaustion and loss of blood. Everyone thought him dead, but later he was resuscitated and the disciples thought it to be a resurrection. The skeptic, David Friedrich Strauss, himself no believer in the resurrection, gave the death blow to any thought that Jesus revived from a swoon. Quote, 
It is impossible that a being who had st stolen half dead out of the sepulcher, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, and who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given to the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death and the grave, the prince of life, an impression which lay at the bottom of their future ministry. Such a resuscitation could only have weakened the impression which he had made upon them in life and in death. At the most, uh, at the most could only have given it an elegiac voice. I don't know what that word is, elegiac voice. Uh, but, but could by no poss possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm have elevated their reverence into worship, unquote. Brother Ted, you get to go first. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I was getting calls from, from work, and every time I get a call when we're having a video call, it, it, dis, it disconnects the signal from anything I can hear from you guys. But anyways, I hope that's over with now. Uh, the swoon theory, what, what a joke. I mean, the swoon theory to me... Is uh, it's on par with nowadays of these uh, willfully ignorant nuts, you know, thinking that mankind is here on Earth because we were seeded, seeded, you know, going out to sow. Some aliens went out to sow and they sowed some humans, uh, seeds of humans on the Earth. Uh, the swoon theory is on par with aliens seeded us here. Um, and think about this, like like the one uh, doctor or historian said, it's it's unthinkable that the disciples would follow this guy. Well, first of all, the swoon theory itself, beaten halfway to death, then crucified, then wrapped up, and then put in a tomb three days and nights without water. Yeah, you're going to survive, you're, and you're going to resuscitate. Yeah, idiots. I mean, willfully ignorant idiots, and that's what I'd call them on a good day. But no, and uh, and then to think that if there was chance that happened, that he did resuscitate after all that, beaten, crucified, uh, uh, no food, no water for three days in a cave, uh, are the disciples going to follow that? Are the disciples going to follow a guy that just resuscitated after all that? Uh, they'd, they'd look at him like, you know, this, this is not someone we're going to live and die for. Uh, they're certainly not going to be the... Uh, robust uh, defenders of the faith, which really uh, amount, would amount to no faith if the swoon theory was true. But uh, that's that. Thanks. Uh, I, I would say that we, uh, we should vote. When we're finished with all these different theories, we should vote on the stupidest one. But they're all so stupid that uh, the wrong tomb, a swoon, uh, body stolen is what we'll discuss next. But first, let me ask Brother Brother Joe, what do you think of that swoon theory? Well, you know, this is this is uh, hard to believe, but 1.3 billion people uh, buy the swoon theory. They're called Muslims, and so uh, that's a substantial lie. I mean, it's, it's a, a substantial uh, part of the world that buys into the swoon theory. So it's not no small thing. But I'm looking at you guys with your beards. Now Christ's beard was plucked out uh, and his face and body were unrecognizable as human. Uh, so three days later uh, he's walking around and he's got his resurrection body. So at first uh, some of the disciples don't even realize it's him. Here's a perfectly restored man in his resurrection body with, uh, you know, they're walking down the road. They don't realize it's Christ at first. Now, if his beard was ripped out and his face was unrecognizable as human and, uh, you know, he's got a, a spear chucking his side where his blood was let, uh, yeah, it's just about as silly as it gets, and and it's the most accepted theory on Earth right now. So, yeah, silly. Back to you. 
Yeah, there, there, are, there are so many stupid elements to this theory that it just, it's just, it's amazing that anybody could uh, accept it. Uh, when we understand the severity of the, the, the flogging, the beating, the crucifixion, the fact that you die from a crucifixion, the fact that you're not uh, taken off of the cross until you're confirmed to be dead, they broke the legs of the other, uh, the people on his right and left, uh, because by breaking the legs, they cannot push themselves up and continue breathing, so they die quickly. Uh, that's how they normally would make sure that someone's dead before they're taken off the cross. But in Jesus' case, he appeared to be dead already, but to make sure, they drove a spear through his heart to make sure. And if, and, if, and if he turns out that he was not really dead and taken down from that cross, that would be capital crime against the, the, uh, the guards that uh, were responsible for making sure he was dead. Everything about the swoon theory, I mean, if, if he was um, in that serious of a medical uh, condition, that, that barely alive, uh, he certainly is not going to seem victorious where people are going to want to follow him to their own death saying he's, you know, resurrected and victorious. <laughs> it's just absolutely absurd. Uh, now, regarding the Muslims, I haven't heard that. I, I do know that, at least my, my understanding of, of Islam, is that they, they don't believe Jesus was actually crucified. They believe that um, uh, God put someone else on the cross, made him appear to be Jesus, and Jesus was never really crucified. It was somebody else that, uh, and so God was deceiving everybody by that. But uh, I didn't know that, that maybe some Muslims believe it uh, in this swoon theory, but I'm not, I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying I understood that differently. Um, any, any other thoughts before we, we look to the next theory, the body being stolen? Brother Joe? Uh, you're probably right, because I, I was assuming they, uh, they didn't believe Christ died on the cross, so I was assuming that uh, they felt like he didn't die during the crucifixion, but uh, substitutionary. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Thanks for the correction. Okay, let's, uh, let me read. Now, the next theory. So we looked at the wrong tomb, the swoon theory. Now, the next theory is the body was stolen. Another theory maintains that the body was stolen by the disciples while the guard slept. The depression and cowardice of the disciples provide a hard-hitting argument against their suddenly becoming so brave and daring as to face a detachment of soldiers at the tomb and steal the body. They were in no mood to attempt anything like that. J.N.D. Anderson has been uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of London chairman of the Department of Oriental Law at the School of Oriental and African Studies and director of the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London. Well, it takes a long time just to list all his credentials. Commenting on the proposition that the disciples stole Christ's body, he says, quote, <clears throat> this would run totally contrary to all we know of them, their ethical teaching." the quality of their lives, their steadfastness in suffering and persecution, nor would it begin to explain their dramatic transformation from dejected and dispirited uh, escapatus, esca, esca, escapus. There I'm, I'm coming across a couple of words here today that I don't know what they are, escapus, uh, into witnesses whom no opposition could muzzle, unquote. Well, that's, uh, I'll, I'll read a little bit more before I get your thoughts here. It says, the, the theory that the Jewish or Roman authorities moved Christ's body is no more reasonable than explanation for the empty tomb than left by the disciples. If the, the authorities had the body in their possession or knew where it was, why, when the disciples were preaching the resurrection in Jerusalem, didn't they explain that they had taken it? If they had, why didn't they explain exactly where the body lay? 
Why didn't they recover the corpse, put it on a cart, and wheel it through the center of Jerusalem? Such an action would certainly have destroyed Christianity. Dr. Warwick Montgomery comments, quote, It passes the bounds of credibility that the early Christians could have manufactured such a tale and then preached it among those who might easily have refuted it simply by producing the body of Jesus. That's interesting. I'm, I'm familiar with the argument that the disciples stole it, but I don't think, I don't recall the argument that the Roman authorities had moved it and were holding it. And, uh, I, of course, I read the book before, but I just forgot that it was a, as a uh, uh, possible answer. Uh, Brother Joe? Well, it just goes to defeat the, the point of the argument. They're, they're trying to make a reason why Christ uh, wasn't resurrected. But in doing so, they're, they're uh, actually defeating their own argument. The Roman government wanted desperately to make sure that body wasn't taken. And uh, they put the seal on the tomb. They placed guards. Uh, why would the Roman government <coughs> take the body? And, uh, you know, if they had uh, any way to, to, to show the body, they would have done it if, if the disciples broke it open and stole it and, uh, I, I, I'm my mind is just uh, swooning right now because I, I don't uh, I don't even get the logic here. Sorry, I can't have, offer more than that, but it just it doesn't make sense. Right. Okay, brother Ted. Yeah, I I had read the book before, but I forgot there was even the, the slightest argument that the uh, the Romans might have stolen the body. Uh, you know, you know, theory is, uh, you know, people forget what the disciples were like. It says, Scripture says, uh, when they all forsook him and left him, it was a, a fulfilling of the Scripture that says, and all his sheep were scattered, you know. They, they ran away in fear. So uh, not only their fearfulness, uh, but their lack, of, their lack of physical might to come and steal away the body from the Romans, uh, you know, quote, while they slept, you know, if somebody's rolling a 2,000-pound rock uh, beside me while I'm on guard duty, <laughs> I'm going to hear it, okay? And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, whole theory is just one body. They were fearful. They didn't have the might to overtake the Romans. Uh, they would have been heard. Uh, and like I said earlier, uh, it, them promoting a lie of a resurre resurrection would have made them liars. They, they'd be false witnesses. Uh, none of these things fit uh, into the category of, of reality and anything uh, reasonable at all. So, back to you. Yeah, I mean, the, the more that we read this book, and I, 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 this is fresh in my mind, these, uh, these uh, arguments, it's just the more excited I am about the the reality of the resurrection and um, the, uh, the absurdity, the desperation of these people to uh, find some other explanation. It's, it is, it's not even laughable. It's just absolutely absurd. Um, and at the risk of sounding like I've lost my mind, I again want to urge everybody to get that movie risen because it's it's really it's about the search for the body. Where is the body? And a Roman so, a soldier is, is put in charge of finding out what happened to the body, and that's what it's all about. It's really, and it's so accurate and so well done, and it, it's almost like a, a good supplement to this book as far as how helpful that movie is. Risen. I've seen it, Luke, and I will. I will attest to the fact that it is a great movie. It's very accurate. Yeah. Oh, the truth comes out now. I finally find that Ted actually saw that movie. I thought nobody had seen it but me. Okay, my wife and I saw that together, and she loved it too. Okay. Um, okay. Now, here's. Um, I'll continue reading. It says. Uh, I guess I should read this last part. No, there's too much to continue for for the study today. Uh, I, I'll pick up here 
uh, uh, next time I'll make mark this spot in the book and uh, I wanted to leave a few minutes for our final thoughts and the uh, uh, gospel invitation here so all right uh, let me Joe I'm going to take you off off the hook you're under no pressure at all Joe you can just relax a little while the pressure is entirely on brother Ted now he gets to go first and he, he's going to sum up his thoughts about the study today go ahead Well, you know, these studies are great because what they do is they affirm uh, the truth of the Word of God. I mean, the Word of God stands alone as the final authority, you know, in all matters of faith and practice. But what historians and apologists like, like McDowell do, the people, they, they do the legwork, they do the studying and uh, the research, and uh, they're just confirming the truth of the Scriptures and the account of the, the person of Christ, the dramatic... Uh, uh, conversion of soul, and of course, uh, the resurrection and the fact that Christ was uh, not only a historical figure, but uh, yeah, he, and certainly he was more than just a carpenter. And so I, I agree. I think these studies are great. I think the people who are watching, they'll just stick with them, even if they have to watch them in just chunks and segments uh, because of time constraints. This is a blessing, not only to, to be participating in, in these, but if you go back and watch them, I, I think these are these are help any Christian. And uh, yeah, get a copy of the book and, and uh, follow along if you can. Back to you. All right, uh, thank you, and, and Brother Joe, your summarize your thoughts for today. Well, I don't know if I if this is a summary of of what we discussed today, but it is what's on my mind. And what's on my mind is uh, people are not given the challenge to consider the truth of, of Scripture. Uh, it used to be in our generation, Luke, that people were, were challenged to discredit the Bible. Uh, Tocqueville challenged C.S. Lewis. Go ahead, discredit the Bible. As we move closer towards what I believe are the end times, uh, that challenge is no longer there, and people don't have a chance to sit down with a book like this or the Bible itself and consider the possibilities that this is the Word of God, this is Scripture, Christ was who he said he was, did what he said he would do. And uh, I'm very concerned. You know, I wish that everybody in America were at least given the facts to consider because my kids and my grandkids will, if, if left to their own devices outside the home, will never be challenged to consider biblical scripture and Christ. And so I'm just very upset that, uh, that so many are going to be lost because naturalists, evolutionists, whatever you want to call them, have erased the potential uh, to to consider these facts, and uh, they they've hidden them, and uh, they're evangelical. The, the the people, you know, the naturalists, the evolutionists, the people who would denigrate the scripture, are not so much other religions. Uh, they the 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 school of thought in today's world is to lightly touch other religions. And, and discredit them, but they take a hammer to Christ, and they take a hammer to Christians, and and uh, they've done everything they can to conceal the facts so that people won't consider what we're discussing today. And you know, if we get a couple, three hundred people that watch this, and you know, probably three quarters of them are going to be believers. Uh, man, I just wish there were some way that that we could at least compel people to look at the authenticity of Scripture and the fact that Christ is who he said he was. And so uh, I'm a little dismayed at our inability to get this information to people, but I guess we're doing the best we can do in our own little way here. Uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, very well said. I, I, uh, I'm saddened also that... Uh, uh, so few people are going to see this video. Um, it says 10 million 
read this book, and did, but that was, I got this copy many years ago, so maybe there's 20 million that have read it now. I don't know, but I, I, I wish there was some way that this was just required reading for every every person in the world, you know. It, if it didn't convince them, at least it would uh, uh, get them get them started in, in, in wandering way. It's like I had no idea that this was Christianity and the Bible is so compelling. Um, but we are doing our our little part, as you say, Brother Joe, and I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure doing it, especially with the present company. Um, okay, I look forward to the next uh, study. We'll pick up where we left off last time, but I want to take just a couple of minutes to tell people uh, uh, the good news that uh, you get to go to heaven if you want to. It's all up to you. And Jesus offers you heaven as a free gift. <clears throat> the Bible says that um, someday uh, all the, the universe will be destroyed and God will create a new heavens and a new earth. And the people who get to live there will have resurrected bodies like Jesus' body after the resurrection. It, it will never get sick or old or die. And it says in the new heavens and the new earth there will be no more suffering or pain or crying. There will only be joy and bliss and happiness forever and ever. Now, if that sounds good to you, the good news is that this is offered to you as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus and the Apostle Paul said in order to get heaven, it's impossible to get it through religious works. But this is the philosophy of the world. Most people, if, if asked the question, how do you get to heaven? What do you have to do to go to heaven? Almost everybody will say, well, you've got to be a good person, and maybe you have to join a religion and follow some set of religious rules, and if you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. But Jesus and Paul said that's impossible. The, 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 the reason that we have the, the commandments and the laws of Judaism and well, the, these things were not a, a, to give us a, a means to work our way to heaven. These are given to us to make us get frustrated and throw up our hands and defeat and say it's impossible. Jesus says it is impossible to go to heaven through your personal merit. But he says it's offered to everyone as a free gift if you just trust him. So that's the important thing for you to understand, is that uh, I, there's only one way to get to heaven. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <laughs> what an auda uh, uh, audacious uh, claim to say that if you want to go to heaven, there's only one way, and it, you got to come to me to get it. But those of us who... Uh, uh, believe we are going to go to heaven because of our faith in Jesus, we've come to the conclusion that his claim is true. We need Jesus. So I want you to know a little bit about him and what he's done. The Bible says that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, it, that means that he was not created like the angels or like humanity. Uh, it, he's eternal. Uh, he is the creator, not a creature. Uh, he shouldn't be confused with uh, the Jesus of Islam. They say he's merely a prophet. He shouldn't be confused with the Jesus of Mormonism. They say he's just one of many gods, billions of gods. He shouldn't be confused with the, Judea, the, the Jesus of Buddhism that, that teaches he's, he's just a highly evolved, enlightened master. And he shouldn't be con confused with the Jesus of the secular world that says he was a moral, upright teacher. The religious leader. Uh, no, he, he, you, you need to understand that he is eternal God Almighty, the creator of all things, and the Bible says he came down from heaven for the purpose of dying. He came and became a man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the reason was so that he could die. You see, God can't die. He had to become a man in order to die, and he had to die so that we could go, we could live. He died on that cross, and that death on the cross served as a payment for our sins. 
So Jesus said, I came to give my life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. Jesus' death on the cross paid for your sins. It set you free from judgment and condemnation in the, the second death in the lake of fire. You're, you're free from that if, if you put your faith in Jesus. And so he truly died. He was truly buried. And he was truly raised from the dead as we've been discussing in this study. And Jesus prophesied, he predicted, he promised a bodily resurrection. He says, they're going to kill me and bury me, but I'll raise myself back to life on the third day, and I'm doing it to prove to you that I am God and Savior. So it's that resurrection that gave the apostles confidence, the early church confidence, that he was who he claimed to be. Eternal God Almighty, the only Savior, the only source of life everlasting. And so Brother Ted, Brother Joe, and I, We've all come to that conclusion. We want you to believe. We want you to be convinced that this is true. And when you are convinced and you believe that Jesus is who we claim to be, that he is the source of life everlasting in heaven, and you trust him to receive this gift, you believe, believe that he not only has the ability to give you life everlasting, but he promises it to you, and therefore it's a done deal. It's, it's uh, irrefutable because... God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. Jesus promised me I'm going to go to heaven if I trust him. And so therefore, like my shirt says, uh, Jesus, I think it, maybe you can read it, one way to heaven. I believe Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. And I believe that I'm going to go to heaven because I put my faith in him. I'm depending on him. And he says, if you trust him in this way, you're certain, you're guaranteed, you're assured you're going to go to heaven. So I'm going to go to heaven. Are you? I'm not going to heaven because I'm a better person than you. I'm not better than you, but I'm probably better off. I'm better off than you. If you haven't received the gift of life everlasting in heaven, and I have, then I'm better off. Even though you might be a better person than me. I don't know. So it's up to you now. Do you want to receive the gift? Put your faith in Jesus now. Receive the gift of uh, eternal life, and, and um, you can know for certain you're going to go to heaven. And that's that's a joy, joy like a, peace like a river, joy like a fountain, I think the scripture says. So, all right, um, brother, uh, brothers, just a final comment from each of you. Brother Joe? Uh, I just hope, uh, hope that you will consider what Luke has just said. Everything we're studying here is all about that. And so, uh, great invitation, Luke, and, and I hope uh, some people hear it that need to hear it. All right, thank you. Brother Ted? Yeah, well, uh, truly, I agree, and this is the greatest news you could ever find, you could ever learn, you could ever believe. And Jesus is the greatest friend uh, you could ever have. Uh, he's someone you can always trust in and it's because he's always faithful. So I would just, uh, I would hope and pray that you folks who haven't believed on him would consider what Lucas said today and and believe uh, the good news, the greatest news you'd ever hear. Back to you, Luke. All right, thank you. And if if ever there was a perfect time for you to believe and receive the gift, uh, it's now because we've been discussing the proof of the resurrection and the absurdity of thinking there was no resurrection. So now that you understand that, knowing that he was raised from the dead, proving he, he is God and Savior, now you should have confidence to put your faith in him. I hope you do it now. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.